You're tuned in to Oilers Nation every day with Tyler Uramchuk, live every weekday on the Nation Network YouTube. Back-to-back days with no Oilers hockey. What are we going to talk about for the next 30 minutes? We'll come up with something. Let's get into it with the lead. Ah, welcome into Oilers Nation every day, coming to you live from the Sports Closet Studio. You like this cool jacket? You like this sweater? You can get them both at one of their three locations, St. Albert Mall, Sherwood Park Mall, Kingsway Mall, or online at sportscloset.ca. It is not a Sherwood Ford Giant game day, so we're going to have to find a way to fill 30 to 40 minutes, but we'll do that because we're live on the Nation Network YouTube, and you are all fired up to get the show going. Shane got the first comment of the day just saying, yeah, baby, sure, why not? Maybe that's in response to Liam saying he wants to see 100 likes on the show today. So if you're watching on the Nation Network YouTube, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button. Scotty was in and said Frank went off on Austin Matthews. Loved it. He did have some spicy takes on number 34 of the Toronto Maple Leafs today on DFO Live. Frank will be around today. We're going to talk some Oilers, and we're going to float him the question about NHL expansion. Interesting. Interesting. Is there any smoke to that? Any fire, I should say, to that smoke? We'll get the truth from Frank Saravalli because he is a well-connected individual. We are going to talk a lot of Oilers as well today on the show. Even though there was no game yesterday and there's no game tonight, uh, there was some, there were some results on the ice last night in the NHL that were noteworthy. The Seattle Kraken won against the Anaheim Ducks, 5-2. to two, The final there, the Calgary Flames beat the Minnesota Wild 1-0, to and the Florida Panthers doubled up the Vegas Golden Knights by a score of two to one. So uh, there were yeah, the Vegas loss is big for the Oilers because now you're sitting four points back of Vegas and they only have one game in hand on you. So that's fine. Calgary beating Minnesota is largely in inconsequential for this whole thing. Uh, I mean, what are they now? Seven points back of the Oilers. Yeah, meh. Um, but Seattle beating Anaheim kind of sucks, although that's uh, more or less expected. Where I want to go, though, is I, I took a look at the strength of schedule that's remaining for some of these teams, and it actually gave me a little bit of optimism when it comes to the Edmonton Oilers. I looked at teams who were, and I know we might be having a little bit of, uh, of an internet problem here, so hopefully we get, uh, we get things fired back up here in just a second. Um, if you close it or hit the refresh button, the audio usually fixes itself, so uh, maybe let people in the chat know that, Liam. But I looked at how many games each of these teams, and that would be LA, Edmonton, Seattle, and Vegas, have against teams with a 500 or better points percentage. And Edmonton's actually in the best spot out of all of them. LA, in their final 17 games, will play 11 teams with a 500 or better points percentage. Seattle has 18 games remaining, but they're also going to play 11 teams with a 500 or better points percentage. The Vegas Golden Knights have 18 games left, 13 of which come against teams who have a 500 or better points percentage. Edmonton, in their final 17 only plays 10. So if you look at strength of schedule, Edmonton kind of has the easiest road for uh, for the rest of this regular season here. It helps that right at the end of the year, they play a couple of weak opponents too. So if they had to rack up some points late, you would imagine they could go pedal to the floor and probably take care of the likes of Anaheim and San Jose. Um, the other thing as I was looking at the schedule, like LA and Vegas play each other once, LA and Seattle play each other once. But Vegas and Seattle actually go back to back to end the season, which I found really interesting. Um, just from the perspective of, you know, if Edmonton's playing San Jose and Anaheim teams that they should rack up points against, I know there's a game against Colorado in there as well, but Vegas and Seattle beat up on each other. Maybe, maybe you need Seattle to win both those games. It's entirely possible. There could be some interesting four point swing nights in the final week of the regular season just because. Vegas and Seattle are uh, are going head to head. So really interesting. Rusty is in and says, um, Rusty's in says the Oilers play Anaheim twice, San Jose three times, Arizona twice. A ton of points available. Yeah, and I know we're lagging a little bit. Um, yeah, it looks like I'm talking in a strobe light. 
That is a great point, Lance. Um, it looks good on my end, and it looks good on you or on Facebook. It's just YouTube's messing with us again today. Our the Nation Network YouTube does not want to play nice with us uh, when I'm sitting here in the sports closet studio. Um, anyways. Yeah, I, I think strength of schedule is a spot that the Oilers could probably take advantage of. I don't want to say fairly easily, but it, it's it's definitely something uh, that will help. I have a listener question I want to float everyone, and it's brought to you by our friends at AMA Travel. But first, Liam, I am going to bring you on here in just a second. Hello. Welcome into the show. Wow. Uh, I got, I'm going to reset my internet, actually, so I am going to float our listener question to you. Or, uh, or do you think you could take this way? Do you think you could explain to the people what we're aiming to do here? With the, the board that I made? Yeah, with the board you made. Take us through it. Take okay. us through what we're doing. I, I'll walk everybody through it. So essentially, before the show, Tyler and I go through what we're going to talk about. So today, we're going to go off the top five most important players for the Edmonton Oilers this season. So, Aaron, do you have that board? Maybe I can ride this one solo here until Tyler comes back. Or is he back? Is Tyler back? I'm back. Here we go. We'll see if this one... Here we go. Well, that was a lot, Tyler. Yeah. Right on the spot, you asked me to host the show. Whew! <laughs> yeah, I know. I really uh, threw you to the wolves there. That was a bit of a suicide pass. <laughs> um, but I hope I'm back now. I, I just gave the internet the old little refresh and uh, i'm hoping i'm working a little bit better here for everybody so we will uh we'll keep the show going here it's a listener question um these are our answers the question is rank the oilers in order of their importance to the team's success in the playoffs um i went and i'm see with that being the question, seeing your list, Liam, I have a ton of questions for you. I had McDavid, Skinner, one and two. You also had McDavid, Skinner, one and two. That feels mm -hmm. obvious, right? You're going to need Connor McDavid to be himself and carry the offense. And Stuart Skinner being at number two, if you don't have goaltending, you're not going anywhere in the postseason. Mike Smith was good last year in a lot of the Oilers' wins in the postseason. They got that goaltending, and they'll need it from Stu. Yeah, I mean, Stuart Skinner feels like the best player outside of Connor McDavid on most nights for the Edmonton Oilers. And yeah, in the postseason, you need goaltender to show up. And especially down the stretch here, the Oilers need to start racking up some wins so they can get into that top three of the Pacific Division. And I think Stuart Skinner, we saw it the other night against who they played Buffalo, where he essentially stole them that game with the amount of big saves he had. I know the Oilers had two saves, wiped off, uh, two goals wiped off the board, but I think, uh, I think Skinner is going to be a massive part of what, what the others got to do here down the stretch. Yeah, and then at my three, I went with Leon Dreisaitl because I know they played together in the playoffs last year, but I still believe that the best way for this team to have success throughout the course of a long playoff run is to have two really elite scoring lines in the top six. I have Dreisaitl at three. They're going to need him to be just as big as he was in last year's playoffs. Hopefully he's healthy, and that means the production can come away from 97 as well. I have Leon at three. You don't have Leon on your board at all. So take me through the thought process of your final three names and why you have no Leon. I was trying to think a little bit outside the box and maybe I thought too far outside the box. Obviously, Leon Dreisaitl needs to be a big part of this team coming down the stretch, yeah. but I'll take you through what I did. So Matthias Ekholm, obviously they brought him in to kind of stable the blue line a little bit. And so far we've seen that and... I think when down the stretch here and into the playoffs, like his style of play is going to be crucial. And I think it can be also very influential to what the other defensemen on this team are going to try and do too with his physicality, him essentially just being a bit of an arsehole and aggressive on the ice with when defense uh, forwards in front of the net. So I like him at three. I went with Evander Kane here for the reason of, I think Evander Kane just, just needs to play games and i think if he can start yeah. scoring again he brings another layer of offense to this team outside of mcdavid and dry side also we saw the damage he could do down the stretch last season when he signed with the others and then into the postseason so i went with him at four for the reason of he needs to play and i went with evan bouchard which was probably an outside one but i just thought about it i was like imagine if evan bouchard got everything going and was clicking on that power play getting his shots through his defensive game was kind of back to where it was last season a little bit and i just thought man the damage that guy could put onto other teams would be something else and 
he's better than what Tyson Berry could bring to this team. There's no disrespect to Tyson Berry, but Evan Bouchard has a better skill set than what Tyson Berry would have. So I was just kind of thinking if he could get everything flowing and start playing with a lot of confidence, then I think he'll be a huge part of what this team can be down the road. Isn't it wild to think that Evander Kane is going to end up with less games played this year than he had last year? And we'll get to the lineup because he is expected to to be back for tomorrow's game mm -hmm. against the Bruins. But even if he plays in all 17 down the stretch, he's going to finish with two less games played than he had last year when he didn't even sign with the team until January. But uh, I want to go back to flashing up uh, the big five list, A.B. Uh, listen, the dry sidle thing, like... I, I think maybe you went a little bit too far out of the box. Like, I don't know. I think they could <laughs> probably find ways to keep winning without Evan Bouchard being a huge factor. Oh. And I probably would have slotted Leon in there. I had him at three. I have Ekholm at four because of the ripple effect that I think he could have on the rest of this blue line. If Matthias Ekholm is playing at his best, that makes Evan Bouchard better. That means you have a pairing you can trust with potentially some really heavy minutes, and that can make life easier on Nurse and CeCe, which will make Nurse and CeCe even more effective in the playoffs. So I really feel like in the domino effect that is their blue line, having Matthias Ekholm as a really, really solid number one piece playing his best hockey is probably the most important part of this entire equation. So that's why I put Ekholm at four. And then at number five, I, I really did think about this for quite a bit. Cause I was like, okay, Ryan Nugent Hopkins is potentially going to be a 40 goal guy for this Oilers team. How can I not have him in the mix as one of these top five? But then I got to thinking, okay, but he's probably going to be playing on the wing and doing a lot of his scoring on the power play, which we love, but you know, that is probably his success is probably dependent on McDavid and dry a little bit more than a lot of other guys. Same thing with Zach Hyman, right? Like I love when he drives play, he scored the big shorty against the Calgary flames last season in that second round playoff series. But again, I was like, ah, a lot of his success, I would just judge more based on his production with 97 or 29. I didn't want to put him on the list of Andrew Kane. I totally see where you're coming from because he's built for the playoffs. He was basically a goalie game last year. I totally understand where you'd be coming from if you wanted Evander Kane on this list. But then again, I thought, well, if I'm not putting Nuge and Hyman on because their success is largely dependent on 29 and 97, then I don't really have much of a case for putting Evander Kane on that list, which is why I eventually checked down to Ryan McLeod because I just talked about how McDavid and Dreisaitl they need to be driving their own lines to give you two elite scoring lines. Okay, well, if Ryan McLeod is playing some really good hockey and maybe he takes a step forward come playoff time and he's starting to drive, maybe alongside Warren Fogle as well, a third or fourth line that can consistently produce offense for this team, that can consistently outchance the opposition, spend more time in the other team's end than they're spending in their own, man, that would be really, really impactful for this team. So I know he might not be used as a center. He's potentially going to play on the wing with Bukestad for tomorrow's game against Boston. But as the season goes on, having Ryan McLeod as the play driver in the bottom six, I think is really, really important for this team. And perhaps more important than the production you might get from a winger in the top six. Like if McLeod can get going and consistently give you meaningful, impactful minutes on your third line, that could help you win a lot of hockey games in a best of seven series. Well, you kind of see in it, somewhat right now right where the bottom six is having such a big impact it's like Derek Ryan had that big goal the other night Warren Fogel's playing well enough where he can step into the top six when you need him and Ryan McLeod too so yeah I, I would agree like outside of maybe the big guns like you said who maybe rely on McDavid and Drysaddle Ryan McLeod can be that guy because he does have that offense he has 10 goals this season so there's a lot of players I think you could really mix in a lot of the bottom six into that like maybe even Maybe even Warren Fogel, to be honest, could have been in that Ryan McLeod spot. But yeah, I, I don't disagree, Tyler. And Leon Dreisaitl would be six. On my list. Leon Dreisaitl is number six. I just said we're only yes. listing five. So yeah. Um, <laughs> looking at the chat, and I do like the point that Lance made. We don't need to see Tyler talk with his hands anyways. We just need the audio and the chat. And that's actually probably a good point as we continue to try to fix the rate at which our video is going out. Um, but you guys were giving your takes in there. Lance said, Liam not respecting Drysaddle just like the rest of the league. Uh, Kenneth, Mark Holland, Rye Dry and Kai have been nuclear as of late. Yeah, let us know your, your top fives here. For this topic i know a few of you sent some in and then i just totally scrolled past them so now i'm trying to circle back um and find them there you go 
James says if Skinner can do what he did for <laughs> against Moostra at the NHL level, the Oilers will win a cup. Yeah, uh, like Swift Curran, he was unbelievable in that run. I'm pretty sure they gave up like a massive package to get him at the WHL deadline as well. But I mean, yeah, Skinner, they need him to be a big name goalie. Uh, Rusty says, I still can't believe that Dry had 17 points in five games against Calgary with a bad ankle. He's a monster. Yeah. Um, that was unbelievable. Les says, I can see Liam's logic. We would need Kane to be the force he was last year and Boosh to step up and play better. And I, and I get that. Like, if if the list is based off, you know, where their line is and how much better you need them to be from their average, I guess is what I'm trying to say, then it makes a lot of sense. Uh, James says, adding Kane to Costin, DeHarnay, and Ekholm, the Oilers will have more snarl than they had last playoffs. I actually think that's, Pretty interesting point. When you look at the bottom six the Oilers were running last season, and I mean, even Darren and Ekholm on the blue line certainly make them tougher than what they were running last season. And then having Clem Costin in the mix potentially as well, I think he's a guy who you'd love to see get going a little bit more ahead of the playoffs. I did think he was uh, pretty good against the Buffalo Sabres as well. Rusty says Clem Costin could be a really underrated playoff performer. He goes to the dirty areas, loves to play physical. He is built for playoff success. And I mean, potentially like getting more scoring from the bottom six is going to be really, really important for this team. And you think about last year in the playoffs, like maybe what they didn't get from guys like Fogel, who was healthy scratched for games, getting Fogel going, very important. Maybe Kim, Klim Costin can be a more effective, more offensively productive version of Zach Cassian. And I know he he maybe doesn't have he doesn't strike fear into the opposition like a Zach Cassian would, um, but still like he's gonna hit hard. He's not afraid to drop the mitts, and hopefully he can bring you a little bit of offense. Because as much as we love to talk about the intangibles and things like that, scoring goals is ultimately what matters the most come playoff time. Uh, Jack Edgington says McDavid, then Skinner, then Dry then Ekholm, and then McLovin. So you're agreeing with me on all five as well. Lance actually makes a good point. Woodcroft should be at number five. And that's, again, probably a pretty good point. I think we saw close to the best from Jay Woodcroft in that series against the Calgary Flames last year. And there's been some moments where I know some of his tendencies have maybe worn thin on parts of the fan base, but I also think that's going to happen with every single coach. It's going to happen with every GM as well. There's going to be things they do that maybe you don't necessarily agree with, but when you look back at the last, you know, now 13 months of the Jay Woodcroft era in Edmonton, you have to be largely thrilled with what he did. And I don't think he cost them very many games in the playoffs last year i remember when mike smith had a bad game one and he went back to mike smith for game two i liked the move because i said hey if you're gonna go on a deep run you're gonna need big games from mike smith and there was a big portion of the fan base i know a lot of them are the negative whatever's on twitter um, but a big portion of the fan base was like no you can't go back to this guy it's got to be miko's net can't trust mike smith but i mean him in game seven shutout against the kings like, I, I don't think you can understate how big he was in some really big games for the Edmonton Oilers last year. Guitar Maniacs goes Eckholm and Bouchard is one and two, and then McDavid Skinner dry. So putting some emphasis on the blue line there as well. Um, yeah, I mean, the blue line also goes hand in hand with the goaltending, right? Like Stuart Skinner has kind of shown through however many games this season. He's not a guy who's going to give up the easy goal, right? Very rarely does one go in where you go, oh, like, you know, you kind of have that cringe moment where you're like, Stu should have stopped that. It just doesn't really happen. Um, so if the defense, Ekholm, Bouchard, maybe driving a potential top pairing, if they can lead the way and the defense has given up less grade A chances, the Oilers are going to give up less goals because Stuart Skinner is a guy who st stopped some really, really hard shots. And for the most part, he keeps the ones out that he's supposed to. Holland says, yeah. hammer the like button. Yes, hit that one. What's up, Liam? <laughs> I was trying to do some research while you were talking there, Ty, about that. Someone mentioned that Stuart Skinner trade, and I knew it had some kind of impact, and I can't remember because I couldn't find it, but that draft pick they moved might have been the pick that got Connor Bedard to Regina, which is kind of nuts to think about. I can't remember exactly how it went, but I remember that draft. There was a lot of talk about it, but I couldn't find the exact trade tree that got it there, but... That was the only draft pick, so just kind of 
It's kind of funny how that all worked out, I guess. Yeah. Um, what was that deal again? Like, it was just, the, it was, all right, I pulled it up here from the news release. The Lethbridge Hurricanes announced they've acquired two, three, four players, a first, a third, yeah. and a conditional second in that deal uh, that sent Stuart Skinner along with Tanner Nagel and Giorgio Estevan to the Swift Current Broncos, and they eventually went on to uh, win the WHL that year, right, Liam? Yes, they did win. God, I love those. Uh, I love those WHL OHL kind of deals where it's like nine pieces going the other way. <laughs> the Zell the chat is taking. This year was too. Yeah, the chat is taking this just a fascinating way. Jeremy Cooper, MVP, says Doctor Gonzo. Uh, Tyler Mulick and Predneski said TD Force at number five. I mean, hey, the Oilers played some, or the Oilers had some players that battled through some really really tough injuries. So. It probably, as much as it's like a tongue-in-cheek thing to say, man, the training and medical staff, probably not even that far off from cracking the top five in terms of having to get through potentially four rounds of the NHL playoffs. Uh, Rory asks if we're the only team without a shutout this season. And I, I honestly don't know the answer to that. And I'm not even sure how quickly we could look it up. Uh, but I do know, and Gavin, the intern's always talking about this. The Oilers haven't had a shutout since game seven against the LA Kings. So it's been a while. Bryce gave us his top five for the playoffs. He said McDavid, then Skinner, Dry, Ekholm, and he is Holloway at number five. I'll push back on that a little just because I don't think Dylan Holloway is even a lock to be in the playoffs on a nightly basis. So I'm not sure if he's going to have a chance to even be all that impactful. Tyler Mulek says Dom's given the Oilers a 10% chance of winning the cup this year. Fourth best odds. Money puck has them at like number two as well. Like the models for whatever reason seem to really be favoring the Edmonton Oilers this year, which hasn't always been the case. I like money pucks 20... model. I think it's lar- Sorry. What was that Liam? Mm-hmm. I was going to say 29 teams have a shutout this season. So there's just three that don't. Huh? Yeah. I don't have the three though. Uh, the Oilers are one of them, though. We know that. Yes. Um, I largely like Money Puck's model. Like I was saying, they have the Oilers at a 96% chance of making the playoffs, a 61.7% chance of getting to round two, 39% chance of making round three, 24% chance of making the final, which is crazy to think they have like a, a one in four shot at making the Stanley Cup final, but I buy it. And then they have them at a 13.4% chance to win the cup. That is second only to the Carolina Hurricanes, who are 17.8%. The Bruins behind them at 9.3%. So the models seem to like the Edmonton Oilers this year, which is music to our ears because we would love to see a long playoff run here in Edmonton. Uh, that was our listener question. Ranking the five players who are of the most importance to the Oilers down the stretch and into the playoffs. Surprised Liam didn't say Devin Shore, if we're being honest. <laughs> I was huh? keeping it realistic. I thought people would go on me for the Leon Dreisaitl one. So imagine if I put Devin score on the list. Yeah, yeah. Our listener question brought to you by our friends at AMA Travel. Two shows from now, on Friday, I'll be doing Oilers Nation every day from Toronto because we're off on another nation vacation brought to you by AMA Travel. It is going to be a good time. These experiences are always unbelievable because of how well AMA Travel ensures they work. It is great stuff. We're excited for the next nation vacation. And hey, if you're planning your own summer vacation, AMA Travel can absolutely help you out with that. I use them for mine. It works. I know it works because I just did it all last week. Check him out at AMA Travel. I see Frank Saravali is Please ready to join to us for his weekly hit. What's up, Frank? I actually oh, I can't. I'm, I'm not hearing program correctly. I'm hearing just through a speaker. Oh. Sorry, Frank. There we go. All right, uh, good now. There, there, we're good to go. Uh, Frank Saravalli's hit is brought to you by Star Mechanical, one of Edmonton's top new home plumbing installers for the past 20 years. Check them out online at starmechanical.ca. And if you need emergency service, they got you 24-7, 780-481-8873. Frank Saravalli, we are back. No deadline talk, though, which really fueled us for the last week. But now that you've oh, had... Thank God. Yeah, I know. You're you're happy that it's all over. Uh, now that you've had kind of five days to sit on what the Oilers did on the deadline as a whole, getting Bukestad, 
getting Matias Ekholm. What do you make of the work Ken Holland did in the week leading up to the deadline? You a fan? Did he make them better or did he pay too much? Well, I, I like that he was aggressive in the sense that he really went out and, and made a move to, to improve this team. Whether or not it's the right move, I think remains to be seen. And I, and I think I'm just a little bit more down on it than most and not to be a Debbie Downer. It's just that I've watched Matias Ekholm pretty closely over the last number of years. And I think a guy with his size, the way that he plays, I just think he's lost a few steps. And I think when you you know, sort of see that decline happen in real time and you then give up significant assets to trade for him, that I think it becomes an overall concerning trend for the lifetime of the contract, which still has three more years remaining on it beyond this one. But I think it's also fair in that criticism to park that and say, who cares? This is about right now, and he's still an impactful player in this league. And this team needed help keeping the puck out of its own net and defending better. And there's no question that Matthias Ekholm does that. So, you know, quit crying in your milk and, you know, get moving forward with the right here and right now, which was this is the most significant trade deadline in Edmonton Oilers franchise history, period, full stop. And if Matthias Ekholm helps your team right now, which I believe he does, then you park that conversation and the rest of it and what Matthias Ekholm's contract looks like in 18 months from now until a later date, and you concentrate on trying to win in these playoffs, which is what the Oilers are doing. Yeah, I mean, you certainly hope, like, again, the last year or two of that contract, maybe it's not great, but if you get 18 really damn good months out of Matthias Ekholm and he's a top pairing level guy for you in that span and you go on a couple more deep runs, you make a Stanley Cup final, I just don't think it'll really matter what they paid. My only criticism of Holland at the deadline is that I think I would have liked one more move. And, you know, you added Ekholm over Barry. That was an upgrade. It wasn't exactly adding a layer of depth or anything like that. You add Bukestad, you move out Pugliarvi. That is, I guess, in some ways, an upgrade. But you didn't add a layer of depth there. Specifically on the blue line, I kind of look at it and I go, okay, on the left side, Nurse, Ekholm, Kulak, you got Broberg there for some insurance, whether you want to go 11 and 7 or if someone gets banged up. You got Nima Linen in the minors. On the right side, it's CC Bouchard, DeArnay, and then next man up, like, might be Jason Demers. I worry about the depth a little bit on the right side and would have liked to see one more guy added. Am I making a mountain out of a molehill, molehill here, Frank, or is that a fair criticism? No, I, I don't think so. I think it's a fair criticism. I, I think, um, Look, the fact of the matter is the Oilers are paying two players that are in their system, their organization, in Ryan Murray and Slater Cuckoo. They're paying them NHL-level money that's parked on long-term injured reserve and, and in Baco. So had this team better uh, scouted, better, you know, did a better job signing depth players, a lot of your concerns would have been alleviated, right? Like it's it's no problem having players like that on NHL contracts playing in the minors. Every team does. Any team that has money does that. But those two guys don't make anyone feel warm and fuzzy. And more to the point, as Ryan Murray continues to rehab, I know he's a left shot guy, but as he continues to rehab, I don't even know that anyone's seen him around the team. Like that has been a legit question mark is, where exactly on earth is Ryan Murray right now? So um, again, not to make too big of an issue out of it from my end and yours, um, that's what you talk about when you speak of organizational depth. And if you're going to sign players like that and actually pay them NHL money, then you need to get NHL money's worth in terms of insurance. And I don't think the Oilers have that. And they had the ability to, you know, speaking of like leaving you longing at the deadline a little bit, they had the ability to trade out other pieces if they wanted to. Like they could have moved on from Warren Fogle. They could have, you know, figured out what they wanted to do to maybe try and just mix it up a little bit and get a better element, uh, get it not a better, but just a different element. Yamamoto was another option. Like, I get that Yamamoto is a, is a fan favorite and, uh, you know, people like him. He, he's just been off this year. And yeah. it all comes back to that 
um, it comes back to the issue that he's got going on with his his neck, his balance, his vestibular system, his you can call it concussion like symptoms, whatever you want to call it. I know for dead not certain that Kyler Yamamoto is not right. And does that pop up in a worse way when when the games start to mean more? Are you getting the most out of him that you can? I think everyone's hoping that he he finds a way to rebound and, and get right, but there's no easy solution to it. He's seen specialists. He's missed two different chunks of time this year. And the last thing you kind of want to be in, in a spot, if you're the Oilers this summer is Kyler Yamamoto at 3.1 million, either on LTIR for the, you know, next summer or the year uh, that follows, or given that, you know, if he's injured, you can't buy him out. Like you don't, you don't, you can't go through another season of Kyler Yamamoto chipping in eight goals and 17 points and, and missing really- vast chunks of time, not at 3.1 yeah. million bucks. So that's, that to me is like a real concern moving forward is what's up with Yamamoto and how do you fix it? And then also the Fogel thing, which was, would the Oilers have been better served being, you know, just a little bit more aggressive trying to change out a couple of those pieces at the deadline. Yamamoto three goals in his last four games, which on one hand is like, Hey, he's starting to heat up, but he's also still missing a lot of quality chances. And he missed another one in the game against Buffalo Uh, talking about what the Oilers didn't do. And, you know, maybe some disappointment from some parts of the fan base that they didn't push a few more chips into the middle. But when you look around the Western conference, Frank, I kind of go, well, which GM did, Dallas certainly didn't. Minnesota got John Klingberg for dirt cheap at the end. Colorado got Lars Eller. Vegas, okay, Barbashev is fine, but what else did you do? And there's question marks surrounding health there. Seattle didn't even know the trade deadline happened. The LA Kings, I guess, are the only other team you could lump into the group with the Oilers as, hey, they actually spent some serious assets and covered multiple holes. But there are a lot of teams in the West that kind of kept their powder dry for the most part. Did that surprise you? Well, it it did only because I think the East also gobbled up a lot of the potential assets that were out there. Like, and and you watch the East unfolding and like, I've said it before, it's going to be a steel cage death match to get through that East to think that two of either the Rangers, Devils, Canes, and the Bruins, Lightning, and Leafs to think that two of those six are guaranteed to lose in the first round it's kind of mind blowing when you think about it. Um, and the West, of course, the same dynamic exists based on the structure of the bracket. But at the same time, I view that as a benefit to the Oilers because the West is just, it's kind of wide open. And I still have my eye on Colorado. You see the standings here today. I, I think that team still wins the West. And, and I don't mean in the playoffs. I mean, in the regular season. Like they're, they could just as easily rip off eight, 10, 12 wins in a row and no one would blink. And they're about to get healthier. And particularly with Landis Cog, uh, as you get into the playoffs that um, I, I really like the sort of mojo that Colorado's had of late seven, two and one in their last 10. And just absolutely walloping the San Jose Sharks on Tuesday night. So outside of Colorado, if you're Edmonton, you're sitting there going, do any of these teams in the West scare us? Like, are we on a collision course for another Western conference battle? There's a lot of work to get through and get done, but like, I don't, I don't see anything at all really separating Edmonton from any of the teams in the Pacific. And I would venture to say that Edmonton has just as good a chance as anyone to win the division. But I I think the fact that they were so, you know, sort of so aggressive for Ken Holland's nature that, they've put themselves in as good a spot as anyone. Yeah, I think from a betting perspective, shout out to our friends at Betway, the Oilers, no matter who they go up against in round one and round two in the Pacific Division playoff bracket, they're going to be favorites in that series. And the one team that would probably scare me the most is the LA Kings. I talked about this yesterday on the show because they're deeper. They could be healthier than they were when they pushed the Oilers to seven games last year. And they just feel like a really bad matchup. But I still think they'd be favorites against them, Frank. Yeah, I agree. And I actually did a little uh, playoff wish list yesterday with our friend Pete Blackburn on Bally Sports. And um one of the two things i wished for is an oilers kings first round matchup 
Like, I think that would be an unbelievable series. Um, I think the Oilers have grown a lot since last year and the spot that they were in when they took the foot off the gas against the Kings, they basically in the games that they decided to show up in toyed with Los Angeles and it still went to seven games. So they have the ability to show some of that growth, but at the same time, the Kings are better. Um, I picked the Kings to win the division at the beginning of the season as one of my bold predictions. They're knocking on the door of that. Their goaltending is now better with Corpus Allo, and they've certainly beefed up and more uh, better balanced their back end. And they've always sort of had a threat to score, but now you know have had the defensive element as well with, with Kopitar and Deneau. And there's just not a lot of space that they give up. And I, I go back to the conversation that you and I had with um, and Connor McDavid right at the All-Star weekend, him saying like, you know, that was one of the turning points of this team season this year for the Oilers was that absolute debacle in LA at crypto.com arena in January that he thought the way that they played at even strength, even though everything went wrong, you could begin to see the pieces come together. That's what McDavid was saying. And, and to think that that might be the springboard to potentially then see these teams collide in the playoffs is yeah. certainly something to dream about. I want to get your take on something uh, you hit on today on DFO Live. We keep getting these uh, these reports. They're not, I mean, I'm not even going to call them reports. These weird little tweets from ESPN cryptic, NHL would... Network analysts. Cryptic tweets about expansion. Frank, the NHL is not considering expanding, are they? Um, not right now. And so I, I actually want to read to you a quote just so that I don't get it wrong. Um, I did trade emails today with NHL deputy commissioner, Bill Daly. And I asked specifically like what, why are NHL rights holders tweeting cryptically and, and hinting at expansion to Atlanta and Houston? And so his answer is don't know. Uh, there's been no change in position on this end. And he says, expansion isn't our priority right now, but it doesn't mean we won't listen to people or groups who have interest. That happens to include both Atlanta and Houston, but it also includes other cities as well. I don't think Atlanta and Houston are in any better or worse position than anyone else who has expressed interest in the last 12 to 18 months. So what can we glean from that? One is... And the NHL receiving expressions of interest from potential ownership groups and or cities is not new. Like this is a normal course of business practice for the NHL to, you know, anytime someone calls, you're not slamming down the phone, you listen and you file that information away. And two, I think the NHL hack actually has to be ready for the potential of a relocation this summer. If the Arizona coyotes get into a spot where they do not have their arena approved by voters in a referendum that goes out on May 8th. This is a this is the biggest day in, in Coyotes franchise history, at least in, in Phoenix, is what happens on that ballot in May. If they do if voters do not approve this resolution, well, they're they're back at square one. And and I would venture to say that given how the NHL views Mullet Arena as a temporary option, they're not gonna stick around for two, three, or four more years to figure it out after things have fallen through in a number of different arena locations. So they're going to need a place to pivot. And, it, and Houston just makes so much sense. They have an NHL ready arena. They have a potential ownership group that's in place uh, with Tillman Fertitta. If he wants to, uh, to be involved, they could also keep the same ownership group and move them. Um, but NHL ready arena, you go from the fifth biggest population or metropolitan area to the fourth in Houston, it's a ready-made sort of corporate center for the league. All, all those different things that factor in population, demographics. It's, it's attractive in Phoenix, which is why they've stayed, but it's also pretty attractive in Houston, which would present it also in a central division that the Coyotes are currently playing in to relocate to. So um, the NHL obviously keeps their finger on the pulse. And unless, you know, Deputy Commissioner Bill Daly going on the record, unless they're doing something behind the scenes that we don't know of, he's essentially putting an end or, or quashing that expansion talk right now. 
Yeah, the Arizona connection's interesting, and I know we'll probably have some people in the chat being like, oh, but Quebec City, and we had some people on DFO Live who were saying that as well, but for the reasons you just laid out, Frank, like have, trying to establish yourself in a massive American media market like that is just worth so much more, unfortunately, as blunt as I'll put it. It just matters more and means more and will make more money than bringing back the Nordiques. Uh, it it does like just from a pure population standpoint like yeah. houston is 2.28 million and quebec city off the top of my head is 550,000 and then you factor in the canadian dollar how much more it would cost to buy the team and bring them in then what they would need to do in business to get to that level to pay off that debt it it just it, it's houston makes a million times more sense, especially if there's only one franchise that's going to be on the move. Like I said, Arizona already plays in the central. The Coyotes were one of those teams that were the few that were actually belly aching about realignment because they're saying, well, now we're playing the bulk of our games outside of our own time zone. And the NHL was basically like, look, we've done a ton to save you guys, like shut your mouths. <laughs> and to move them to Houston, like, oh, hey, Central Division line, like you could almost draw a line on the map from Winnipeg all the way down to the bottom at Houston, where everyone kind of neatly fits in that corridor right down the heartland of the United States. Interesting stuff, as always. Maybe we'll have some some relocation talk in the summer. Wouldn't that be a bunch of fun? It was, uh, but we have. It was one of my bold predictions, not this season to start the year, but last season before they got to Tempe and Mullet Arena after they were being unceremoniously kicked out of their uh, their home in Glendale. I was just out there uh, for the Super Bowl and walked around the Coyotes' old arena. It's bizarre that they only host concerts there now. The name of the arena has changed. There's still some Coyotes logos in the pavement. They changed the name of the road from Coyotes Boulevard to Entertainment Boulevard. Still kind of amazing to think that that's how it's played itself out. But here we are. Um, I don't know. Maybe I was just a year ahead, kind of like I was in my prediction that the Winnipeg Jets would win the Stanley Cup. It looks like a team that has rebounded quite nicely to make the playoffs this year. Yeah, they're currently holding that second wild card spot. They've been sputtering a little bit as of late, but with Connor Hellebuck between the pipes, uh, you'd imagine anything is kind of possible. Uh, Frank, we'll talk more about the playoff run and the playoff races and all of that next week. Thanks for giving us some time. We've got plenty of time for that. And uh, until then, see you later, Tyler. I'm just always, why do you, why do you kick out Liam every time I jump in? Well, I, I, it's kind of, Liam, do you have a question for Frank? We also don't have uh, we don't oh we do have a three box made. I do have a question, Frank. If you if you got a little extra time, for you anything. <laughs> I I want to know what's going on with these NCAA free agents. Are the Oilers linked with any NCAA free agents? So you're a little premature on my reporting on this because it's on my list okay. of things to tackle this week. I've been uh, rather lethargic on that front, so I apologize for my laziness. Typically, I'm well prepared. Uh, I have not checked in with the Oilers and what uh, they may be in the mix for or not. But you know who I've just read yesterday is doing a great job on the college free agent front is our old friend Chris Peters with Flow Hockey. Mm -hmm. He had a list of top 10 college free agents, I think, that he published yesterday. Chris Chris is on the ball, man. He killed it for us as our prospects writer at Daily Faceoff. And uh, he's got the names. So in the next few days, I'm going to go through that list of names and begin to connect the dots between those players and teams. Any name Sounds that good. stands out we'll to check you, back Liam? Next week, I know you're a prospect guy, Liam. Is there a name that stands out to you? Uh, I, I'm just sticking in the Alberta region. Like Ryan McAllister and TJ Hughes were two guys who were really good for the Brooks Bandits last season, both playing in the Michigan area. So I'd be curious about those two names for the Oilers potentially. All right. I will report back. There you go. Thanks, Frank. Chat Sounds next week. Good. See you guys. Frank's appearance is brought to you by our friends at Star Mechanical. StarMechanical.ca. Give them a follow. Go find them on Instagram as well. I tagged them in a story up on uh, Oilers Nation today, so it's easy to get to. Liam, that's two guests this week who have demanded that I bring you into the interviews, which yeah. I should add, you are always more than welcome to do. I feel like a dick now that I keep getting called out for this, but it's just what we've always done. <laughs>
No, I, I, I'm, I'm good with the flow, Tyler. If people want to talk to me, I, I'll think of some questions. But I, I interact with the chat, the chat a lot when we're when we're doing those segments. So I, I'm good with whatever works, buddy. Yeah, uh, we're just splitting up the workload. Someone's got to interact with the chat. You guys get itchy in there if we don't give you enough deten- uh, enough attention. Prescott, how about we put a team in Lethbridge so the Flames and Oilers can finally unite in dissing the real dumpster? Oh, come on. Lethbridge doesn't deserve <laughs> that, Prescott. Why do you got to do that? No. Um, Les says put a second team in BC so we can see two teams struggle. But on yes, the low hanging fruit of relocation jokes. So good. So good. David Wilson says Fort Mac, probably good corporate money up there. So, hey, why not? But mm. no, like I could totally see Liam, that relocation move from Arizona to Houston. Just cut your losses on the whole Arizona thing. It's not going to work. It sucks. It's too bad. Move them to Houston, restart, get that new franchise kind of buzz that you would have in there. Get an owner who's willing to spend in Frittata because he would. I guarantee you the Coyotes wouldn't be doing any of this LTIR bullshit that they're doing now if they had an owner willing to spend. So, yeah, I, I'm with you, Tyler. And I also think just from an expansion perspective, like the league's not there yet. There's not enough talent throughout where you can, you can just distribute it that much. Right. Like I, the last couple of years, we've had two expansion teams to add two more, like, ugh. Seems like you're just bringing yeah. it down a lot. I think the league's like a few years away yet before we even get closer. But Houston would be good. Houston would be good. The NHL, when you rank the big four North American sports, they're fourth. It's the NFL, oh, yeah. it's the NBA, MLB, and then it's the NHL. And there's a bit of a gap there, a pretty significant gap. For them to decide that they're the first league healthy enough and strong enough to go to 34 teams, I think would be a massive mistake. Let the NFL do it first. Hell, let MLB and NBA catch up to you at 32. I just, the NHL, I don't think could sustain 34 teams. 32 is a great number as well because exactly half make the playoffs. It splits up perfectly into four divisions as well, which you would lose if you went to 34 teams. 32 is a good number. You don't want to water down the product anymore. I'm not sure if there's enough in there for them to even go the way of 34 teams, like enough quality players, like superstars. You want stars on teams. You want marketable players on every roster. And you could argue there's not enough for them to even sustain 32 right now, never mind 34. So I I think expansion at this point would be a massive mistake. Give uh, Craig says Houston and Dallas, you'd have an instant rivalry. Boom. Egan says all the snowbirds yep. would hate it. I'd say too bad. <laughs> I I think if if the NHL did want to expand, it would have to help other development leagues maybe expand a little bit more or help their development and stuff. Like like stuff, for example, maybe the NCAA, they help push them out more west into the California area, maybe like Washington or something like that too, just to kind of get things flowing there and then you create more buzz around players being from California and then that'll help you bring more teams out West, for example. So I think that's just the next step, but I, that's probably what 20 year plan anyway. And we just got two new teams, like we said, so not too worried about the NHL expanding the NBA though. The NBA is on the rise. That's that league has got to expand. I would love to see Vancouver get an NBA and MLB franchise in the next couple of years here when those two leagues expand, just because it'd be a lot of fun to just dart out to the coast, quick flight, watch baseball, watch basketball, come back in a weekend kind of thing. It would make for some sweet sports trips. I am surprised considering how many fans show up to the Seattle Mariners games when the Blue Jays are, are in town, that there isn't a team in Vancouver yet. Like, maybe that's just eventually down the road that's in the plans but it would be a good spot let's move along to our betway wrap for today the golden knights lost yesterday which means i didn't win my bet liam but it means the oilers got a little bit closer to the golden knights in the standing so it's a win for me even though i lost a little bit of money consider that my donation to the oilers push for top spot in the division uh the leafs also beat the devils yesterday so we were kind of double losers yesterday but let's look to bounce back what do you got yeah, I also had Declay and Keller shot prop. He had one shot, but he did have three points. So I was halfway right. I got the number right. But tonight, I am going to go with the Minnesota Wild on the money line to beat Winnipeg. 
Minnesota has just not really been allowing many goals recently. What was it last night? One nothing shootout loss to Calgary, and they've actually been on a pretty good run. I think that was their first loss in four or five games. So I like Minnesota and Winnipeg, and then Seth Jones has four goals in his last three games. If you want to bet on him to score a goal, it's plus three hundred. I didn't want to go that risky, but in all three of those games, he has hit his shot prop, which is still reasonably valued. And and Chicago, I get it. They don't have a lot of offense there, but Seth Jones is still a good hockey player. So I, I believe you could get that again tonight at minus 110. Pretty good value. Mo Sider, Kirill Kaprizov, shot props played together, plus 149 on the parlay. They've both hit it in four of their last five. Kaprizov aver averaging, blech, easy for me to say, Kaprizov is averaging more than six shots per game over his last five. He is ripping the puck, plus 149 on the parlay. Could probably straight up play Kaprizov as well, because I think it's like minus 130 on Betway. So uh, give me that shot prop parlay, courtesy of our friends at Betway 19 Plus. Please play responsibly. On the out-of-town scoreboard tonight in the NHL, there is just flat out not a lot to keep an eye on because there's only Not three fun. games Minnesota taking on Winnipeg don't really care what happens there Chicago Detroit don't care Anaheim Vancouver don't care but tomorrow on a Thursday night in the NHL there is a bit to keep an eye on because we'll have <clears throat> Ottawa in Seattle to take on the Kraken Nashville's taking on Arizona LA's playing Colorado so maybe an interesting spot there for the Oilers to catch up to the Kings a little bit if the Avs can take care of business but I mean, the Oilers got to play the Bruins. They got to worry about their matchup tomorrow night. Vegas is also playing Tampa Bay. So it's kind of interesting how all three of these teams, Oilers, Golden Knights, Kings, are playing elite competition tomorrow. And hey, Seattle's even playing a Senators team that's playing some pretty good hockey, 6-3-1 and one in their last 10 games. Looking good since they got Jacob Chikorin. So tonight, rest up. Tomorrow, big day around the league, right, Liam? Yeah, big one. And I wish the NHL would get away from doing these nights where they only have three games on the, the Wednesdays, usually it is. But they got to figure that out if they want to expand this league, for example. So, yeah, big night tomorrow in the NHL. I think it'll be – I think the Oilers can do it, though. I'm, I like the Oilers' odds against the Bruins, which seems very odd to say. There you go. So some expansion talk. We got through it, everybody. We actually almost went an hour, which is crazy. Shout out to everyone for grinding through the stream issues we had throughout this bad boy as well. We'll be back at the big studio tomorrow for a Sherwood Ford Giant Game Day edition of the show. Shout out to Sports Closet, AMA Travel, Star Mechanical, Betway, and our friends at Sherwood Ford. More info on their mobile service department in the description of today's episode. We'll be back tomorrow, Noon Mountain. See you then.